morning. Well, good morning where I am. Hi, everybody, wherever you are, <laughs> no matter the time. Uh, it's 11 a.m. for me in, in Argentina. And I am very, very pleased to be introducing you to today's uh, LTC Fridays presenter, uh, Elaine Marshall. And Elaine Marshall is a, a professor of Island University, Hudson Campus, where she teaches courses in TESOL and multicultural education, primarily online, using the SOFLA model, synchronous online flipped learning approach, which is, which is what she will be presenting to us today. Her research in and sustaining education and non-traditional approaches to grammar instruction. Her most recent book just published is Meeting the Needs of Life, a guide for educators. You can contact her at elaine.marshall at liu.edu. And I am really happy to be introducing you to Elaine. I have already um, uh, seen this presentation and I think it's wonderful. So I'm really happy that she can do this for uh, IATEFL and LT6. So Elaine, the floor is yours. Right, and I just wanna, wanna thank you so much for inviting me. And also to note that it's, as many of us know, it's only to the web heads that we can turn when, uh, when we're looking for more professional development uh, out in cyberspace. And this is just a shout out to all of the web heads and the fact that I did present it uh, as a learning together presentation. And if you aren't familiar with learning together, it's open to everyone and uh, you can schedule yourself to present, which is what I did. And I would just encourage you to either present or attend presentations. And that's how I got transferred over to be invited today. <laughs> So I'd like to welcome everyone. If you haven't already done so, put in the chat where you're from. And those of you who did the pre-work, I know where you're from. You're from all over the world, every time zone imaginable. So uh, just share uh, if you just came in. And even if you shared earlier, the people who are coming in now didn't see that. So you might wanna still pop in where you're from so you can see where everybody's from. Um, also, um, I'm going to ask you, I know Vicki just said it, but uh, you know the presentation is on SOFLA. So what does SOFLA stand for? Who knows? Who knows what SOFLA stands for? It's an acronym, right? <laughs> what does it stand for? Pop it in the chat. So we have it in the chat. What does it stand for? Anybody wanna give it a shot? She did say it and if you, there we go, there we go. Okay, so now I'm going to, uh, to share my screen and there it is, SOFLA, Synchronous Online Flip Learning Approach. Okay, so this, this presentation is about a particular approach. And I'd like to just say in advance that to take what you, what you need to take away are the principles. So when I give examples, I'm gonna give them from the classes I teach, but you would adjust them to the population you work with. And the thing to keep in mind is, is the principles of the model, all right? So my first, uh, my first poll is coming up and here we go. There are only gonna be a few polls today, but the first one is, did you do the pre-work? So please answer the poll. Did you do the pre-work? And tell the truth. Did you do the pre-work? Because we know that 23 people did. <clears throat> All right. And, uh, I'm going to, when I do the polls, because we have limited time, I'll wait a little and then I'll close them. So 
I'm going to end the poll. I realize people are still coming in. That's okay. Uh, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. This is just the same results I've gotten every time I present, which is 50-50. And I noticed in, uh, in the uh, pre-work, one of the questions was, what is your pressing issue about this? And some of the people mentioned uh, not doing pre-work is an issue in flipped learning. And so what I want to do, first of all, if you did not do the pre-work, we have a link going into the chat, a link to the pre-work. I'm going to ask you to go do it now. But caveat, number one, there are several sections. The first section is me on a video. You can skip that because I'm right here. The second section is a few questions, three or four questions. It'll only take you a minute to answer those, answer them. And the third, uh, the third piece is also um, a short uh, video. You don't need to watch that at all, okay? So just do the questions, all right? Bye, go answer the questions. Okay, now, for those of you who did the pre-work, what did I just do? So what I did was, I wasn't punitive. I didn't say, you didn't do the pre-work. How are you going to participate? No, no, no. But I was firm. I told them to do it. And so the thing about pre-work is if, they, if you don't insist on pre-work, flipped learning falls apart. The whole thing falls apart. So you have to be insistent, but kind. And there are two reasons why this will work. And I'm going to talk about it in a later part of the webinar. One reason is eventually there's peer pressure. So someone will say, oh, did you, did you understand in the, the lesson, the pre-work lesson when our, our teacher said so-and-so and they say, oh, I don't know, I didn't watch it. Oh, you didn't watch it? So there's a little peer work there. There's also FOMO, fear of missing out. So if you send them to do the pre-work, whether it's a virtual or a physical classroom, they're gonna miss something, okay? But what they miss, you want to make it be not something that is part of your actual lesson that you're going to work on with them. So that's what I've done. I've prepared two slides that we're going to do that are not SOFLA slides. So they're not going to miss SOFLA while they're doing the pre-work. All right? So that's the logic of what I'm doing. Okay? And now we're going to go on. Uh, okay, the link to the pre-work should be a Google link uh, and it should be working. Okay. All right. So, um, so we did, we did poll one and there's another link here. Also, if you're watching a recording, I've put the polls on the slides because when you record in Zoom, you don't see the actual polls. So that, that was the first poll. And uh, if you're watching the recording, I'll be leaving it open for responses and you can still virtually participate by doing the pre-work, okay? All right. Um, just one, one um, uh, just a second, sorry, please. Um, do, are we to do the um, uh, poll again or the survey? Do you, we need the li link in the text chat? The link that uh, you just showed on the website, uh, on the, yes, on the slide, sorry. Sure. Yeah, that's that's the link it's, to the pre-work, right? Same I link. I, I just popped in. I popped yeah, in. There I can it post it again. Sorry. It's right there. Okay. Okay. So Thanks, Len. Thank I you. start with all my presentations start with my mantra. Mantra, create fertile spaces. That's my mantra for everything that I do. And why do I do that? Well, think about Bloom's taxonomy. What's the top of Bloom? If you're thinking of it, the top is create, right? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't we think of ourselves as creators? And so I'm asking you, and it, because it's a mantra, we all have to say it, otherwise it wouldn't be a mantra. So whether you wanna turn on your mic for a second or not, in your room, close the door, <laughs> and everybody at the count of three, let's say our new mantra. One, two, three. Create fertile spaces, okay. So why do I say that? Because I'm trying to shift your mindset. Most people think about uh, delivering instruction, covering curriculum, meeting standards. And my philosophy is that if you create fertile spaces for learning, 
those other elements will come into place. But if, if you're not creating these spaces, then you're not going to be encouraging students to feel that they can accomplish what you need them to accomplish. And so creating fertile spaces becomes the foundation of what we're going to do today. Now, many of you already do this as teachers, but maybe not online. So the whole focus today is how to create fertile spaces online, okay? And I do it with four E's. And in another webinar, I go into much more detail on these two slides I'm gonna show you, because today we're focusing on my particular model of teaching online, but the overall philosophy of it uh, is in another um, more detailed webinar on the philosophical concepts that, are, that under, underlie SOFLA. But the four E's are equity, enrichment, engagement, and empowerment. And these, this slide will show you the basics of these four. The first is providing equity means access to instruction, curriculum, and assessment. Now, when you think of access, usually you think of who has devices and what do they have? What kind of technology can they, act, can they access? That's not my area. There are other people who can address that as to what types of devices you can help students uh, to use for various types of lessons. What I mean is more pedagogical access. So I mean, some students are comfortable learning online and others are not. And so one of the things you wanna do is you wanna, you wanna front load and attend to the students who are new to online learning so that they can be more comfortable. And without that, they don't even have access to what you're doing. And as I said, I go into more detail in another session. The second is enrichment. And we must enrich, equity is not enough, because right now, I don't know where you are or what you're doing, but people have family members and pets and phones and all kinds of other responsibilities that we're competing with when we're trying to get them to uh, attend to what we're teaching. So you have to enrich your online instruction in order to build that integrative and intrinsic motivation, because otherwise it's all instrumental and extrinsic and how many points do I get and what do I have to do and checking boxes and nobody learns languages that way. Okay. And the third is engagement. Once they're motivated because you've enriched it, now they're motivated, you've got them. Well, they're going to engage with your activities and engagement leads to participation. And again, we know that if they're not participating, you know, it, uh, it's, not going to, it's not going to become uh, input for them, intake. Intake will not happen. All right. So the th last is empowerment. And um, I like to say here, and I'm sure you're all language people, so you know what I mean. It's not a transitive verb. You don't empower somebody. People feel empowered because you've created fertile spaces for learning. So if you provided equity, and added enrichment and it's led to their engagement, then they'll feel empowered and then they will begin to take ownership of their learning. And that's really our goal because you don't really learn something unless you take ownership. And I'm hoping that today you're gonna to take ownership of SOFLA. So let's do it. Let's go to SOFLA. All right. Um, one more poll before we do, because SOFLA is based on flipped learning. I need to know something about what you know about flipped learning. So let's see who we've got here. This is a poll to find out, and there usually is somebody who's never heard of it, but let's see who we've got. Just basic flipped learning, nothing fancy, just the concept itself. Okay, we have a mix. Most of you have heard of it, but if you have not, so I'm going to end the poll and share the results. Okay, so, um, oh, we've got some people who use it in their classes. That's great. All right. Um, I use, I've flipped everything now. It, I did them one at a time and eventually I flipped them all. 
Um, that's one of the things to understand is that you have to give yourself, you know, time and you don't flip everything all at once. And uh, there's an article also that I've written on how to get started with flip learning, six recommendations, etc. cetera. Um, and we'll get to that shortly. All right. So I see we have a, a range, but most of you know the, know the deal. All right, so I can do this piece fairly quickly. Uh, what I wanna do is show you the original definition of flipped learning that I was on the board and helped to write. Uh, so the definition, the official definition from Flipped Learning Network is that flipped learning is a pedagogical approach in which direct instruction moves from the group space to the individual learning space, resulting in a dynamic transformation, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, that is interactive and a learning environment where educa the educator guides students as they apply concepts and encourage creatively, encourage students to engage creatively in the subject matter. So the Bloom terminology there of creating and applying, I tried to put in this definition. Um, but if I were writing the definition today, and this is what I'll be talking about, I would change, and in fact, I've got a little blog drafted that, that's coming out soon. I would change the first part that the direct instruction also needs to be dynamic and engaging. And that's an, an interactive, and that's an important piece of SOFLA. You can't just say, put the direct instruction there. You have to talk about what the direct instruction needs to look like. Uh, and I'm just gonna share with you um, the site and we can put in the chat the link to it. Um, I'm going to share the website. So this is the definition site. This is the PDF. And we talk about four pillars. Uh, the second pillar is learning culture. And again, the change that I'm planning to make that I would like to make for the second pillar is to create fertile spaces would be the third item. You see the others all have three. I wanna add create fertile spaces uh, as the way to create a learning culture. And so that, that's the next on my agenda to take a look at that. And I'm going to be showing you uh, shortly a, sh a little lesson, a mini, mini lesson on that second pillar uh, of learning culture. Okay, great. And in the chat, good, it was put in the chat. That's great, thank you so much. I really appreciate the links going in the chat because that gives me something that uh, I don't have to think too much about. Okay, all right. So now that you've been uh, reintroduced to flip learning, I have one more poll. Uh, and uh, that poll is going to ask you about delivery mode. So I'm interested in knowing for those of you out there, when you teach online, somehow that got to be two words, it should be one, it's okay. When you teach online, what do you use? Synchronous, asynchronous, both, or you need a dictionary? I think with this group, since it's the LT SIG, <laughs> that last one, but I like to put it there because, you know, sometimes the terminology uh, isn't familiar to everyone. And certainly in your classes, you know you're always being attentive to who knows what uh, vocabulary. All right, so it looks like most of you, I'm gonna end the poll, most of you use Apologies. Apologies, Len, we lost your audio. Uh, can you just stop a moment? Can you perhaps uh, restart the screen sharing? We don't hear you anymore. Len? These are the eight steps and we're gonna go through the eight steps. Naturally, we don't have a lot of, a lot of time. It's a webinar setting. So I'm gonna take you through the steps and feel free to put in the chat your questions and your reactions. If I, if I don't find that I can answer questions on the fly, I get the chat and I will 
answer your questions after the fact. Uh, I send answers afterwards to anyone who posts a question. Uh, but I find that going through the, the eight steps, because there are eight of them, I wish there were fewer, but I gotta get through the eight. So that's a time, a time factor. But while you were, I was giving you a chance to do the screenshot, I just want to point out also that this hasn't been published yet. I am finishing my semester, and as soon as I do, I'm going to work on writing it up. I've been doing SOFLA for five years, and I have written it up, but not the eight steps. So the eight steps is a new way that I conceptualized it, and I find that easier for people to actually implement it if I spell out the steps. Um, I'd also like to point out that the slide has uh, the mantra in the corner, they all do, and the SOFLA in the other corner. But at the bottom, I have, as everybody does today, I have my website, my uh, MALP LLC, and my MALP logo, so that um, this is my original work, and it's all part of what I do. MALP is Mutually Adaptive Learning Paradigm, and that's where a lot of my publications um, ha are, are devoted to um, the question of um, culturally responsive and sustaining education that Vicki mentioned um, when she did the bio. So I really have two hats. My actual hat where I have degrees, and I don't have any degrees in online learning or any of that. That's just webhead degrees. <laughs> I just figured all this out. I'm sharing it, okay? And so I'm really interested in feedback. I love feedback on anything to do with this. Okay, let's go. So now we're gonna do, here we go, step one. So step one is the pre-work, of course. So think about that. And this is the out of class portion. And as I've said to you, it, it, has, to be, uh, it has to be dynamic, it has to be Structured, interactive, multimodal. Uh, it has to be something that um, you can get feedback from the students and give them feedback, all built in. And you need to be able to have access to the data of what they're doing in their pre work. And then you use that as you plan instruction. And I'm going to be showing you an example of this step one. And that is what I use for it, which is uh, PlayPosit. And there's a link for that. So I'm going to take you to PlayPosit. And we're going to actually do a pre-work together. And it's not going to be a, a, an English language pre-work. It's going to be something relevant to you. So it's going to be on uh, the second pillar of flip learning. All right. So I'm gonna um, share my screen and take you to play pause it. Okay. All right. Um, share my screen and play pause it. Okay. So uh, play pause it is like any other application. You can also use other ones like uh, Ed Puzzle, or you could put in the chat if you if you know others that are similar. So it's like anything else. These are these are my classes, and you can see I do um, this class 660. That's the grammar class that I teach. But today we're doing the flip learning, so we'll do that. And I I'm going to show you in flip learning. I have a longer one if I do like a full day session on SOFLA, but this is a three minute quickie for us. So we're going to do the three minute uh, quickie. All right, uh, and let's see, here it is. Okay, uh, now you can see here, I have, I'm gonna pick up the speed. You can control the speed and slow it down for your uh, learners. Uh, so I'm speeding it up <laughs> for you, all right? So we're gonna take this and you'll see how it works. Short video lesson on flipped learning. Can you hear? And this is your guide to creating a learning culture with flipped learning. Learning culture is one of the four pillars of flipped learning. And Can I'm you Helene Marshall, I'm your sure. guide. Okay. So let's look at the learning culture pillar. Here are the tenets of the pillar. First, that in a traditional model, the teacher is primary in terms of the source of information. But in flipped learning, we shift that instruction to a learner-centered approach. 
And so class time is more dedicated to exploring topics in much greater depth, and it creates learning opportunities that are very rich for our students. Students become more involved in constructing knowledge, and they participate actively in class and evaluate their learning in a way that is personally meaningful. So we're going to take a look at all of this, taking a deep dive, and here we go. Some basic principles first. Now here is where we have a question. So please, in the chat, because we're not actually in Play Posit together, so you put it in the chat. Put it in the chat and do A, B, C, D, because you don't have to write the whole answer. So we're just gonna do an A, B, C, D. So what's correct? A, B, C, or D, based on what you just learned. Just put in your response. Notice it's which is not true. So three of them are, and which is not. Which is not true. It's a tricky question. Which is not true of a learning culture? Which is not true? Okay, so we're not gonna wait for everybody to answer, but I'm gonna put B because a lot of you did select B. I don't know why it's not selecting B. Hang on one second here. Okay, now when I click B, notice it says uh, correct, but it also gives information. I preloaded that. So you don't wanna just say, yeah, great job. You wanna show them why they were right. And if they put a different answer, you also preload the feedback for that. Well, I see why you said that, but remember this and that. So you put in whatever you want, uh, as the uh, feedback. Then the student must say continue. And when they hit continue, teacher talk, it continues. So the research shows that 65 to 90% of class time is teacher talk. This can be from directions and procedures, explanations and clarifications, or feedback and evaluation. So take a minute to self assess and think about your own classes. All right, and here's your next question. Now here, it's not a right or wrong, it's a percentage. So think about this. How much are you doing teacher talk? And the reason I ask this question, just put a percentage, please everybody, and you know, think about it. Uh, one of the things in uh, flipped learning and SOFLA in particular, is there's much less teacher talk. You'll see when you see the activities that we do in the other steps of the eight steps, okay? So there's a lot less of teacher talk. I'm gonna put 50% because that's what a lot of you said. And there's no feedback here because it's a poll. People can put whatever they want. But it also gives you data. Whatever, when you do a poll as that, you get the data. All right, so let's continue. Our next concept is hand raising. There is some soft data on this showing that 80% of the time, 20% of the students are hand raisers. Either they're answering display questions, in other words, they know the answer, or they're providing unsolicited contributions to the instructional conversation, something they feel they wanna add or say without being called on, or they raise their hand to ask a question. This could be about directions or about the content. Uh, so take a minute and think about the extent of hand raising uh, in your classes. Okay, so here again, it's your choice, what you put, just put a percent, but think about it. Um, I'm actually against hand raising. I'm on a campaign against it because I have a lot of uh, reasons to believe that uh, it's a waste and it's not really helpful to have individual students raise hands. We know who does and who doesn't. It's usually the same people. And there are a lot of things I've written about that. My, my latest book, we talk about uh, what do you do if you don't do hand raising and why it's not a good idea. Uh, we're not talking about that so much today, but it is relevant because I don't do hand raising at all in SOFLA. Uh, and so what did everybody say? 20%, that's about what the data predicts. Okay, let's go on. is the way we're doing right now, 
they watch their video lesson and they get feedback from me on each question they answer and you can see the green are the ones that they got correct and the red the ones that they had trouble with this is a question of with 31 students and also they can give feedback so I can see their score on the questions and they can rate the video she gave it a five out of five which is great and then she but she gives a lot of comments about what was hard for her what what she didn't understand etc so feedback in both directions which enables me to differentiate instruction and scaffold it properly all right now this is me live talking not my not my video I stopped it now because I want to show you isn't this um, useful you can see the the green so I know they got that in the pre-work and now I don't need to worry about teaching that piece because most of them got it and if anybody didn't I can give them individual that's that's part of differentiating and the ones where they're more uh, the, the the red I know oh wow they didn't get that we need to do something with that in class and so this is how you get the information this is a very important piece with flipped learning is is to use the pre-work as a way to design your instruction. Uh, so I wanted to make sure you, you saw that and how valuable it can be. All right. Well, give me your feedback. All right, so now what do you think? I wanna know what you think, okay? You think, you think you're gonna be getting master, individual learner mastery from something like this? True or false? In general, what do you think? Just put true or false. Most of you are probably going to say true, but if you think not, I'm interested in why you think not. Um, if you can, if you think not, if you say false, maybe you want to put something uh, in the chat to indicate why you think that might not happen. But I'm going to call it true for now, because a lot of people did put true. Uh, and what I'm saying is that's what you're doing now. So I'm getting a lot of data from you about your understanding of uh, the learning culture pillar uh, of flipped learning. Okay, now we're back we're and done we can with discuss the video, flipped but watch learning what together. happens now. Now I ask the student what they thought of the video. I want them to tell me what did they think of it. And this is, this is very valuable because some students like it, some don't. They didn't learn much, whatever. I get all kinds of answers here. Anyway, give your answer. What do you think? And again, it's gotta be in the chat. So just say what you thought. It was average or I liked it or just put what you want. Put whatever you want. Yes, I download everything. I get it. I get it. It's it, it's um, it comes to me and I put it in a and an Excel. I mean, yeah, I put it in an Excel and uh, I analyze the data. I use the data. I analyze it. OK. All right. So I'll, I'm going to just say because some people put loved it. That's great. But I'm going to put liked. Now, watch what happens now. <clears throat> It says next, it didn't say continue, because this one is set up for two parts. So they can't just say they liked it or they didn't like it. They have to tell me why. And so this is the, a different kind of question. This is they can put whatever they want. So this is where, if you remember that, te that the person said uh, she, gave it a, she gave it a high rating, but she talked about what she learned, what she didn't learn. So this is your chance. Put whatever you want. What is your reaction and I'm just I have to put something in order to end it here um, I'm just gonna put interesting uh, and submit and you can put whatever you want what do you think and that's it and we're done okay so that's that's the end of that uh, demonstration okay so let's go back to the to the, you're seeing it, I'm sure. Okay, so um, so do you get the idea now how the pre-work that everyone says, oh, they won't do it. Do you see how you need to really 
work to make this happen. That, is it time consuming? Yes. But once you do it, you've got them and you can keep using them over and over again, the same ones. I just copy them for the next semester because I want, I want to keep the data that I collected from the class. And I've done this, like I said, uh, for five years. Okay. So you get really good data. All right. Now, the other thing is I wanted to show you, because this wasn't for language. This is what you would do for language. All right. And this is another one where you might want to do um, a, uh, a shot, a screenshot. Um, and uh, this is an article that, uh, this comes from an article that I published on uh, flip learning, not so flip particularly, but just flip uh, with um, uh, a colleague of mine. So uh, I think we have that link there. Okay. And um, I'm not going to do anything with it now because we could do a whole discussion of these options, but you can see all the different ways that you can take something out of the classroom and make it be the pre-work, okay? Anything that you can do that doesn't have to be done with you live can be done as pre-work, all right? So this just gives you an idea of what you could do, be doing, okay? Now we're going to get to step two and our time is short. So I wanted to spend a lot of time on step one because that's the issue that most people are concerned about. So I'm going to go through these other steps more quickly, uh, but I'm going to show you just what I do. Again, you might do it differently. So for the sign in, I always do a sign in when they come. This is for the, the, um, the, the synchronous. So they come in, they have to lift their name, and I give them something to do. Sometimes it's, it's uh, cognitive, so I want to know, this is accountability, I want to know, did they watch the video, did they do the reading? So here I have, for example, a chapter I said, um, you know, can teachers help with this issue? I had expected them to read the chapter. Everyone put something down. And then uh, the other cognitive one was a video. Um, I asked them what surprised them or puzzled them about the video. Sometimes it's me, sometimes it's not. Sometimes I have a video of, of another professor. It isn't always me. But you also have to recognize the elephant in the room, so to speak. So sometimes the sign in is, how is the other day, last week I asked them, how is the COVID, um, how, how is that affecting you um, and personally and professionally? And we had a real discussion about that. Uh, or sometimes I ask them vacation, what are they planning? Okay, so, um, so that's the sign-in activity. And again, they don't wanna miss it because if they miss the sign-in, they don't get, you know, that's not their, their lesson. They're missing the first thing in the lesson and they don't wanna miss it. So. That's another strategy that I have. I always start with that. So that the lesson doesn't begin with me. The lesson begins with them. They come in and they're doing it. I don't start the class, they do. Okay, step three. Step three is this is where I take the data that I got and I figure out what I need to work on with them. So this is, this is kind of dangerous because you don't wanna be the teacher dominating. So you set up an activity that the whole class can do, but you're not the one that's in charge of it. You've set it up. Uh, and you use your time there to clarify something from the pre-work that they didn't understand or to take something they did understand and have them apply it and do something more with it, okay? Um, so in my class, for example, we were studying the difference between um, a more structured lesson uh, in teaching English or more communicative. And I gave them a whole list of characteristics and they had to make a, a T chart uh, and figure out which kind of um, methodology was used uh, for that particular type of lesson. So that, but that's because that's what I teach, second language uh, acquisition. Okay, then we do breakouts and it's really important they love breakouts. So you do breakout groups and you've probably done them. If you haven't, it's really important to. 
So you, and you already know, right, how to teach. So you can do jigsaw where every breakout room does something different, or you can have them all do the same thing. This is accountability though. You have to make sure that they have a whiteboard that they're creating and they're gonna report on it. And they, you know who's in each group. And sometimes they, um, they chit chat and all of that, but that's okay because you want them to build relationships and all of that sort of thing. So it's not a, it's not a problem. And you can visit everybody's room so you can ask them questions and they can raise their hand, okay? So it's, re it's really important. And sometimes you put, you put different groups together. You some, if you look at the last thing of, on this uh, particular um, slide, you can see you group them however you wanna group them. I'm not gonna get into that even, it's just on the slide. And you'll get the whole, all these slides, you can look at them. This one though, is the most popular that my students love, which is the peer instruction. And for peer instruction, uh, it's the chance that they get to teach each other. And I give them a tiny little narrow piece that they can choose from a list of different ones. And they prepare, they use Screencast-O-Matic, and th there's a link that, that we can put in the, in the chat. And I've also written uh, a blog from Screencast-O-Matic that talks about using this with students. And they, they love it. They love to learn from each other. Again, it's not you, it's them, all right? And uh, they, they, do, they do little questions to the class. They actually make their video ahead of time. And then in the live session, they show the video, they pause the video and ask questions. And then at the end, they give a quiz and I download the quiz. And then I get to see, did the students learn from their fellow students? So that's an important piece. And I, I was going to show a sample, but I think we'll, we'll run out of time if I do that. So I'm gonna skip it. Uh, but I was gonna show you one of my students and show her little video, but anyway, we'll move on. Okay, so step five. Step five is after the breakouts, they come back and then they share and the whole group convenes. So if they've done uh, everybody something different, then they share. And if there are some people want to speak, you can have some of them speak, have all of them speak. Or sometimes if they've all done the same exact uh, activity, you pull out one group and they share, and then they can talk about um, contrast of the different groups and talk about that, okay? Um, and again, um, you, you guys already know, I mean, you know how to do group work. So you just do that and you make sure that you have, uh, you have a share out so they can share. And by the way, everything is, is going to be put up on the pl platform. I happen to use Blackboard, whatever you use, everything gets put up so that they can see it later, right? Trans anything from any whiteboards that they create, all right? Now on the right, I just want to mention a colleague of mine, uh, Khalid Fethi from Berkhan, from Morocco, which is, by the way, the, the Clementine capital of the world. I've been there. <laughs> anyway, um, it, one of the things that's important is students giving feedback to each other, right? And unfortunately, usually they just say, oh, everything's fine, you know, and, the, and they don't really have a good way to give feedback. So uh, what I've done is I've started using Shaq and Khalid came up with it. And what he does is he has students use any one of these. So they're working with a peer and they can share something related to what the peer did and expand on what the peer has done, or they can help the peer and say, oh, you know, I can help you with this and, and show you how to do it a little differently, or they can ask a question or they can give general comments. So this is really a good way to help students give uh, feedback to each other. And I use it in wikis or in uh, discussion groups or um, any kind of blogs and in the online 
uh, synchronous pieces too from the breakouts. Okay, so I just wanted to add that for you. And there should be a link uh, to the article that he and I wrote about uh, Shaq. Okay, now step six. So uh, step six is the one that sometimes I leave out and I skip it, but because I run out of time sometimes in class, but don't skip it because this is what gets them motivated to do the pre-work. So here, what you do is you show them something related to what the pre-work is going to be to get them motivated and ready to do it. So for example, if it's from a textbook, you can show it as a PDF and go through the book and ask them questions and they might try to answer them. And then you get an idea of what their prior knowledge is. And sometimes you get them where they're curious about it. And it's a little bit like the problem posing of Friere where um, you explore ideas uh, and then they go and study the material. Or also um, Musalam, who has a method of flipped learning, which is explore, flip, apply. So you get them to explore something ahead of time. Also, you can introduce concepts, terms and concepts that are new, that prepare them so that when they look at the material, they already have in their head some of the new concepts. So this way, they're curious, they're interested. Also, you get a little bit of uh, prior knowledge information of what they really know and don't know about what's coming up in the topic. So this is a really important uh, piece, step six, all right? And then step seven is the assignment. And I don't need to spend any time on this because it's just a list of all the different kinds of assignments. And as a teacher, you give them whatever assignment uh, you want to give them. You can give them video lessons, readings, um, maybe they're collecting data on some something that uh, they're looking at and depending on what it is you're teaching. Uh, in some cases they might be spending time on making presentations to the rest of the class or they're working on uh, on some type of wiki or uh, blog or something like that. So whatever it is, you give the assignment. And then also, it's really important that you give the assignment during your synchronous, but you also post it as an announcement so they don't sit there and try and, you know, copy it and get clear about it. So you always send out an announcement on the, on the assignment, what is the assignment, and you also include the link to uh, the recording of the synchronous class, okay? Uh, and then last is, you remember the sign-in activity where they first came to class and you give them a sign-in and they put their name? So this is at the end of the synchronous class. They reflect. And this, they put their name, so they stayed the, whole, the entire time. So again, this is accountability, okay? And they have to say something about the lesson. So what is their takeaway? And if they put, oh, great class, I erase it. They can't just put that. They have to put one idea that's a takeaway. And they might have a lot to different, of different things to say, but they have to pick one. And uh, we, get that, uh, we get that whiteboard and I post it up on Blackboard and they get to see what everybody is taking away from class, okay? So that's the reflection, which is uh, step eight. Okay, and I just want to come back to uh, four questions that are very important that you need if you're going to use flipped learning, and in particular, if you're going to learn uh, the SOFLA model. These are the four questions you have to ask. The first, and this is an article that is coming out in, in should come out in a couple of weeks, it's in Mosaic, it's called Mosaic, which is the New York State TESOL newsletter. Uh, it's just the first, it, first publication that's coming out, uh, and we talk about flipped learning. 
So what, what to move to out of class and what to put in class. So the out of class is the asynchronous and the in class is the synchronous because now we're talking about it online, right? So you have to decide, right? That's question one. The second is to make sure that for the out of class, which is the pre-work, the assignment, make sure that you're maximizing the comprehension and the retention, okay? Make sure that they're really learning something in the out of class portion. And the third is in the in class piece, the synchronous that you're doing, you wanna make sure that you're building in a lot of interaction. I mean, right now I'm doing all this talking. There's not a lot of interaction, right? But when you meet your class, remember it's gotta be interactive and differentiating with each student, okay? So you can do private chats and when you do the breakout different groups, you can think about how to set up the groups and make sure that you're differentiating and you're reaching all of the students. Okay, and then the last one is for both the out of class and the in class. And, and this, I made this mistake, but now I've got it, <laughs> which is you have to have accountability because if you're not having accountability and you're giving them feedback, then students are not going to be engaged in the material. Uh, they won't do it. So this is really important that if when you do the breakouts, make sure they're accountable. Um, the pre-work, make sure they're accountable and give them feedback. So those are the important questions, the guide questions that you need to ask. And um, this was just to show you, which I don't think you really need, but uh, it's my course, an example of what I put in my course, my, um, my uh, Blackboard, I use Blackboard and I have a course. If I could show it to you very quickly, um, and I could show you what it looks like. Uh, let me see. Um, I just want to show you. So this uh, this is a class just to show you. Let's see if I can pull this out and make sure you see it. Uh, all right. So um, so this is the class. Uh, and I have everything here, the links, links to the online classes, the announcements, the syllabus, all of this, all right? And I think it's, it's pretty straightforward. And I have also uh, a weekly checklist of what they need to do each week. These are my uh, lessons, my, my pre-work examples that are here. Um, so you can see each one, these are the lessons that they click and then they go into uh, play posit. Okay. Uh, Elaine, and then just to point out to you, we have another five minutes and would like to leave some questions. Okay, sure. All right. So at any rate, you can see these are the trouble, sp trouble spot instructions uh, for them to do the peer instruction. Okay, so that's fine. So you get the idea. Okay, um, let's go back. All right. Okay. All right, and then the last poll is just an invitation for you to tell me that you're going to reflect on what you just learned now. So let me ask you the final one, which is right now. So are you willing to do a reflection? I'd like you to reflect. Are you willing to do a reflection? And the link is there and you can do a reflection. It will help you to think about the soul flaw and what you're taking away from it. And it will also give me some more ideas about uh, what you think. So the last one is forget about it. You're not going to do it. Okay. So that's all. So I'm going to end the poll, share the results. So most of you said you are going to reflect, which is cool. That's great. Okay.
So I'm done. And uh, this is my email. And uh, you have the link. And um, I appreciate your attending. And any questions that you have, I can answer now. And I can answer uh, by sending you my responses. So any questions? Hi, Elaine. Have? Thank you yes. so much. I have been recording some of the questions. So I will be asking you. Uh, uh, we have a few. Um, the first is um, the feedback. Uh, uh, this is a question for Joshua. Uh, is that feedback one to one teacher to student or is it peer to peer conversation around the pre work? Well, the, the way I set it up, the feedback is in advance so that it's for whatever they answer that's feedback, all right? But then I separately through Blackboard, I go into it and I open up their responses and I give them individual feedback, separate individual feedback after I have looked at all their responses and I give them individual feedback. So I give both okay. individual feedback in Blackboard. All right. Yeah. Uh, another question is, if you need to use the data from the pre-work, do they need to finish it by the evening or a few hours before? Ha, so how yes, I give them a deadline. And I say, look, you know, I need, I need you to do the pre-work by X date because I need to plan my lesson based on what you do. So I, give, I make it like two days to give myself two days. And then I, I, I have to plan the lesson every, every week. I have to plan it based on um, what they did. Yeah. yeah, I give them a deadline. And um, if they don't do it, I send them a reminder. I say, please, I need your data. I need you to do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Belen was asking, what, what is the average length of the synchronous lesson to be able to carry out all the steps? Okay. So... <laughs> I, because I teach graduate school uh, and we have to do uh, a certain number of contact hours and my class meets once a week. So our class is two and a half hours and we meet two and a half hours with a 15 minute break, but it's only once a week. So if you meet more than once a week, you can break it up. Um, but that's what I do. Perfect. And another question from Heike is, will flipping reduce class time? I'm not In sure. In your experience, if you were not doing the flip classroom, would the class have to be longer? Or does doing the flipping... This has, uh, this, this has to do with a little bit of the commercial reason because we are selling, in language tradition, we're selling our life class time mostly so if uh, if the flipping would it reduce class time that means can students get away with only half an hour of a lesson instead of an hour it's a commercial sort of based question as well 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 the way i used to do it before i had the out of class pre-work i i taught them i had to actually spend a big chunk of my time with my slides and my instruction. And so there was much less of their activities. So I just didn't have time for that. So what I did was I put it out of class so that we could do activities. But the time, the time of meeting is set by my by university. I have to do 37 and a half hours over the semester. And so I do it. But the question is, that most of it, I want it to be interactive when I do the contact hours. So I still, okay. I don't increase or decrease the time. I'm told I have to do it. Okay. Uh, we have another question from Joshua and, and it's about the breakout uh, rooms tasks. Um, okay. It says uh, that if tasks with outcomes to present or teach work well, but how, how how to do it to do really good tasks for the listeners 
I'm, I'm not, I'm not clear listeners, meaning <laughs> what, what, I'm not clear. I think what I understand is that some, some, some people are good at doing things, but may, maybe there are some other people who are more laid back and, and prefer to listen, like different types of learners. And, and how do you make sure the task make work well for everybody? Or Joshua, do you want to chip in? Okay. Maybe other people have ideas because right now I'm not, I'm not teaching, uh, I'm not teaching language learners. I'm teaching grad school. Yeah. They're getting degrees. So I'm, I'm not doing direct service of, of learners, language learners. Um, okay. We have one more question. How long is the pre-task video on average? Okay. That's important too. Um, if you make it too long, then uh, they get, they lose interest and can't handle it. So I try to make it a half an hour tops. For, but again, it's graduate students. If you're doing it with uh, language learners, you want to make it shorter. Uh, mm -hmm. You need, you need short lessons, maybe 15 minutes, something like that. You can't make long videos because it's, they won't be able to take it in and you're going to be building in questions. So it um, will take longer. Does this mean more work for the teacher in your experience? W what is more work? Uh, the SOFLA. Okay. So what it is, is it's a tremendous amount of time uh, that you have to invest to set this up for a class. But once you do it, you can use it every, every semester. It's done. So it's, it's very time consuming, but then you've done it once. Like I, I just copy everything over and I link to everything. So you want to make sure that you don't talk about Tuesday or Wednesday or something like that. And you can use it over and over again, use everything over and over again. So you have to put your time in only once to create it. All right. I think uh, we have only one more question. Uh, is there a danger of the out of class work becoming by stealth, the presentation part of a PPP cycle? The danger, again, can you say that? The danger, uh, uh, instead of doing a PPP in the classroom, uh, the pre-work will be the presentation stage of the lesson. I don't know why I'm not understanding the question. That you're not doing the direct instruction in the synchronous piece. The direct exactly. instruction is outside of class, but mm -hmm. you do put a clarification of something that they did not understand, then that's part of what you actually teach when, you, when they're coming in the synchronous piece. I'm, I'm okay. Not, or if that yeah. answers the question. I think that clarifies it. Yeah, there is a, the, the direct instruction is what we would call the presentation stage of the lesson and it, it's moved out of class, but oh, you would include oh. some interaction anyway. Yes. Okay. All right. So Heike. Okay. <laughs> Thank you ever so much, Len. Thank you very much. And what I would like okay. to do is um, I would like uh, everyone, I'm going to unmute you all now. Is that okay that we can give her a round of applause? Okay, I'm unmuting now. Can we give her a round of applause? Yay, thank you. <laughs> we are not hearing the applause. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, so, yeah, now we're so, hearing, uh, so, yeah. so, <laughs> so I, I just, I just, I just want to say that. Um, esto. There's sorry, I had to, <clears throat> I had to unmute you again. Sorry. Um, okay. Sorry. Say that um, there's someone in Australia who is going to do a dissertation based on <laughs> SOFLA and is going to do, because uh, I, I've only got informal data but this person is going to do an actual study of SOFLA 
and uh, get some results as to how it's working. And I would be really interested if any of you want to try SOFLA, I'd like to know. Because so far, I'm, I seem to be the only one doing SOFLA. So if anyone wants to do SOFLA, please contact me. I would love for you to try it. Yeah, <laughs> Lynn, uh, what we will do now, if that's okay with you, is we will stop the recording. So yes. today is Friday, Friday, the 1st of May. Everyone that you're here, this is wonderful, on the 1st of May. And it's, um, it's, this was part of the LT SIG Fridays uh, event series. Next week, we are going to see Gary Mottram again um, at the same time and also within the framework of the virtual round table. We thank Lynn very much. Could you perhaps, Lynn, could you stay on a little bit for a um, question and answer informal chat, maybe just 20 minutes as we are closing the recording and this will be off the record. If that's okay with you, thank sure. you very much. Fine.